You read that title right, today's secrets about Survivor All-Stars will be the most I've ever covered in one video. These are the things they didn't tell us in the edited television show, and what is great is how the official DVD and Blu-ray releases of each season of Survivor contain some secrets that are game related, some that are personal thoughts, and some that are just plain silly, and we will even find out how one Survivor snuck matches up their butt into the game and still will not admit to it to this day, along with so many salty people. It's a lot. Basically, as long as it isn't part of the show that aired on television, it is fair game to be considered a secret. And while most of the secrets here are focused on season eight all-stars, some of them do apply to Survivor as a whole. Thank you for watching what I make and ultimately supporting what I do here with liking, commenting, and sharing. For only a few bucks a month on Patreon, you can pick what videos I make, watch all this channel's content early, and even get exclusive videos every month. Thank you for your support. Heads up, this list contains the secrets that I personally found to be the most interesting. Not every single secret in existence about this season is in this video. So with that, let's count all 66 of them in absolutely no particular order. 39 days, 18 all-stars, one survivor. Number one, let's waste no time. Someone snuck matches up their butt for Survivor All-Stars, and I have three different sources of information on this very event. Our first source is Jeff Probst, who's on the Conan O'Brien show around the time of season 12, and he's pretty vague on who it is, but he gives details on what happened. A couple of seasons ago, we had a guy who kept saying, I'm not really worried about making fire, you know? I think, I think I'll be okay with fire. And we, we realized something was funky about that, and we frisked him and found out that he had he had hidden some matches in the darkest of orifices. What? So he hid matches up there? Yes. That seems to me like it would be dangerous. It probably was, but that's how- You get it started a serious ass fire going. <laughs> <laughs> that's a problem. That is it. We said bend over and, uh, yeah. and found him. He's talking about Richard Hatch, winner of Survivor Borneo. Here's what Rob Sesternino, another player on All Stars, knows about the situation. I only know, I can only tell you that this happened because when I went to the Survivor All-Stars finale, I saw one of the producers produce the film canister in a, a more traditional sense. And finally, let's hear it from the man himself, Richard Hatch, who if you pay close attention, still does not admit to anything while also admitting to everything. I think it was Kathy went to a producer with some matches and said to that producer that she'd gotten them from me and that I'd told her I'd smuggled them in. Will we ever know if I actually put matches in a container, stuck that container up my butt, held on to it for who knows how long. I don't even know if it's possible to have smuggled something in up your butt, but that's the story out on the internet. Number two, with these returnee seasons come some casting misfires and us fans wondering why certain players didn't get to come back. So let's rapid fire some of the missed casting opportunities for the season and why. Links in the description for the source of this info and for other things as well. Elizabeth Filarski, AKA Elizabeth Hasselback from season two, the Australian Outback became a co-host for The View at the time and simply just doesn't want to play again though she was asked after her losing hair on her season due to malnutrition i can understand why number three the runner-up from survivor marquesas nalia says she went through the interviewing process for all stars but was simply just not chosen to play number four this comes secondhand via jenna maraska but heidi strobel of survivor the amazon was also asked back but she just turned it down just like elizabeth before her number five sean rector from survivor marquesas he really needs to come back says he went through the interviewing process just like nalia and was basically an alternate for the season that is a shame. I really do want to see him play a second time. Number six, Roger Bingham and Michael Scoopin of season two were both considered, but were ultimately just not chosen. And I am guessing that's because this cast already had plenty of players from the Australian Outback. They didn't need more. Number seven, Kelly Goldsmith from Survivor Africa was an alternate in case Jenna Maraska dropped. So she was pretty close if she knew who she was an alternate for. And here's another player I want to see a play again, just like T-Bird from Africa who was the alternate for Tina Wesson. Number eight, Jervis Pearson went through the entire process for the show and was ready to go, bags packed. 
but was disappointed when he was not called the day they flew everyone out. As it turns out, casting is not very good at telling people who are considered that they won't be playing. They just leave you hanging. Number nine, on the podcast series, Talking with T-Bird, Sandra Diaz Twine gives the details on why she wasn't on season eight All-Stars. And also, in case you were wondering why she wasn't on season 16, Micronesia. I found out I had parasites, didn't even know it until I got the checkup for, for All-Stars and, um, and then for the second one, uh, Micronesia, like she said, the night before they cut me, I thought they were calling me to give me the itinerary about what time the car was picking me up, taking me to the airport, and it didn't happen. But I think it wasn't meant to be. You know, they always placed me at the right time. You know, I have mm-hmm. to say that I give them credit for that. Number 10, All Stars is one of the six seasons to have commentary tracks on the DVDs by the players of the season. And sometimes Jeff joins them. He just doesn't join them for this season. But this season really delivers with those commentary tracks by having nine episodes have them. One of the commentary teams is Lex, Kathy, Sheehan, and Alicia. What makes this great is how soon they recorded these tracks after the season had only recently finished. So wounds are pretty fresh and people are still very salty. Hence why Alicia and Sheehan fight for three straight minutes at one point. And I'm wondering if they edited this down. It's pretty insane. But I'm just going to give you the highlights from that three minute fight. This is the I'm moment where Mark Big Tom Thank finally very much. smartens yeah. up and says we yeah. need to stick together. And I'm like, well, it's about time. He's so Tom. lying to you because he's he's so lying because he's telling me something else altogether on the side. Yeah, but she and everybody was lying to you. Do you not understand that? I understand. <laughs> I, they were so lying to you. That's that. what's so funny about no. this is that they Big were saying Tom the whole I. time. Big, Big Tom, Tom and I. Of course he, he was wasn't. So was Alicia, and yeah. so was everybody else. But everybody Shane, was lying. Do you lying. think people were telling you the truth out there? Actually, Rupert did. Okay. Did. Ooh, um, exactly, yeah. dude. Hot. Because you know, I'm not going to listen. What? You tell you me feel lies. Hot. Hey, else you know what? People, it out. people <laughs> wanted to vote you out. That was it. <laughs> and it didn't make it didn't Shabuga. make a difference. Shabuga. I didn't have to listen Shabuga. to you to know any difference. <laughs> she and for some reason, I feel like you think that your one vote would have made a difference for everybody. <laughs> and and quite honestly, you know what, Alicia? When you call these all stupid people. Alicia? I take serious offense you know to that what, because Alicia? your one vote the game did not make is a over difference. For... Call me a stupid person, I'm going to tell you straight out. You did she what? call you no, stupid? I'm yeah. not gonna... You stupid people. Stupid, stupid oh, people. You she know what? I did. I'm going to defend stupid. myself. You yeah, know what, probably. Alicia? Exactly, you need Kathy. to get over it because I, I called don't need everybody to get over stupid. Anything I called everybody stupid. I'm the only one sitting here, so I'm the only one that has to talk about it. I'm talking about the game. I am talking about it, but I don't want to get antagonistic with you about it because it happened to me four months ago. Yeah, but there's no need to get antagonistic. I'm not trying to, but you're yelling at me. I do like I'm your hair. So I, not yelling. I at do you. like your hair extension. You want to hear yelling at you? We'll do, you know do that outside. I, I, Number eleven. Back in season two, the Australian Outback, we saw the rise and fall of the Colby Donaldson Jerry Manthe relationship. It is enticing television, but it seems like each subsequent time these two return, the show becomes less and less interested in them, which is a shame. In a secret scene from this season, Jerry and Colby share a heart to heart with each other and Colby reveals to Jerry something we all suspected, but we suspected it on Heroes vs. Villains, not here. It was a bit of deja vu to look across the campfire and see Jerry sitting there. It's been a long time since we played this game together. You know, hopefully time has healed some stuff for Jerry. Colby and I are having some pretty nice conversations, and I'm glad to see that there aren't any harsh residual feelings there anymore. Mm -hmm. Hey, if I get cut, I'm okay with that. That's the biggest difference this time, is I am truly okay with the fact that I can be sent home at any time. Colby, he's ready to go. He's been very open saying that, oh, if I get voted off, I don't even care. Number 12, this next one is commonly known amongst hardcore fans, but most casual viewers have no idea. And when you hear it, it makes so much sense why people were anti big moves. All the prize money this season was doubled with the exception of the winner. So moving up one spot this season was a much bigger deal than before and led to a lot of conservative gameplay. The one thing that I will say going into that as well, is that there was some talk that this was going to be two million dollars survivor all-stars that they're going to raise the prize money what they did do instead of making it two million dollars it's only one million dollars they bumped up all of the prize money uh so second place got two hundred fifty thousand dollars third place got like a hundred seventy five thousand dollars fourth place got a hundred something thousand dollars so they bumped up all of the money so to come in fourth on this season was as good as coming in second in another season. Number 13 of the commentary teams, Lex, Kathy, Sheehan, and Alicia are the most salty. From now on, I will just refer to them as commentary team two, 
for simplicity's sake, but all four episodes they comment on, they just trash Rob and Amber. Like this time, because Rob supposedly still lived with his parents before getting married. Um, this boss and Rob is like lightning foot. Yeah, he reminds Monkey me man. of a 10 year old kid. Yeah. So we we should have just sped it up a little We're, bit. Well, he's kind of like a 10 year old kid because he still lives at home with his mom and dad. Oh, that's true. Oh. He does. I just want to grow up. He does. Oh, like to oh, I'm a big boy, boy, boy now. I live my. with my parents. <laughs> <laughs> Number 14, what really happened with Richard and the shark he caught? As it turns out, a lot more than we saw on the show. He says he caught it cleanly, but the cameraman didn't record this. So Richard decided to stroke his ego that he would do it again for the cameras, and that is when the infamous bite took place. And there's the cameraman sitting on the boat. What? He's hanging out on the boat, and here's me with my shark. Buck naked, half a mile offshore. Cameraman is ticked off. I'm gonna get fired, are you kidding me? This is ridiculous, I need to get that shot. You need to do it again. You need to do it again? What the hell are you talking about? Ego, ego, ego. Ah, okay, I'll do it again. I want people to see me catch a shark with my bare hands. What a moron I am. I push him under the, the rock with his head first and I try to pull sufficiently at the same time as releasing his head so that he can come back out and I can grab the head and uh, that's all on film and I'm a shark catcher. The shark rips around with his head, latches onto my arm right there. You can still see, I don't know if you can with this footage, but you can still see a couple of the teeth mark. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't pull or I would have pulled off the chunk of my arm. I couldn't, you know, jiggle him back and forth or I would have sawed through what was the flesh that he had attached to. So I made it all the way into shore and I never got the shark released until I got a rock to pound on its head to get it off of uh, my arm. Number 15. Do you remember when the tribes were struggling so hard early on that survivor basically gifted them all a pot that had a clue painted on it for where to find a key? Yeah. We hear from commentary team number one, aka Rob Sestronino, Jenna Maraska, Tina Wesson, and Rudy Bosch. Well, Shapiro done screwed this up hard, but who is to blame for this pot fiasco? We may never know. Once we get the fire going, we start cooking with that pot and we <laughs> burnt the clue off it. Well, so we were trying to go- Why did you get the clue we were, before you we burnt it? We were trying to go by memory. Like they had me memorize it, but it, I, was, I wasn't 100%. So it took us a little longer to find the clue because- The poem from the pot, word for word, as best I can remember, goes something like this. You need to be strong and go through the jungle and go to the land where the beach becomes rocks where it was sand. You're looking for a cluster where the jungle turns into many rocks and then one stands alone. Then you will find the tree. And on the other side, there's a key underneath the tree. And then in the dark under a tree is where the key will be. See down here in the corner where they don't want you to look? They want us to go to That's the our flag. We're on the completely wrong side of the island. Tom Buchanan's cartography skills are lacking a little bit. He doesn't know how to read a map. Number 16, the dream team. Whenever we get more information on them in the behind the scenes of a season, I gladly include it. Basically, these are the young guns who help construct and test out challenges. They're also the ones we constantly see hiding their faces on the show whenever we see an example of how a challenge is done. So every season, I hire young men and women, usually 18 to 25 or so, they're, they're my general PAs, production assistants, and their main job is to test and rehearse the challenges so that we know if they work, we know where we have to place the cameras, we can see the parts where they go a little faster, a little slower, and just gauge how we need to shoot the challenge. The Dream Team is a great representation, but it's not perfect because we don't have a 75-year-old man and we don't have a 42-year-old housewife. We have 18 and 20-year-old kids. Number 17. Remember that this interview is not too long after Palau, but was included on the All-Stars DVD. But basically, it is revealed that these kids obviously don't have the same drive as those on the show because an endurance challenge for them doesn't take nearly as long, and this can cause problems when uh, the production doesn't know how long a challenge is going to go for. And go 100%, like, it's, like it means your job. These young, fit kids sometimes don't test the challenges as hard as a competitor competing for a million dollars will compete. Well, a more specific example of, of what the dream team, a dream team test that wasn't accurate was when we test our endurance challenges. 
and we get the dream team to come in and either uh, stand on a stump with their hand in the air with a bucket of water that's going to fall on their head or um, you know stand on a log and they go for three or four hours and then we come challenge day these competitors are so afraid of losing immunity they're out there for 11 hours and the crew's asking me how long is this going to take I'm like I don't know five or six hours trying to be conservative and it goes 11 hours and you're rushing out with lights and and flame bars and fired and trying you know shoot in the dark number 18 rob sesternino made a podcast series one time going through the first 30 seasons of survivor i will link you to the all-star section in the description but truly his podcast on this season in the amazon are gold i highly recommend getting those two pretty much since he was on both those seasons he just dumps a lot of information about both of them and here he reveals a lot of information about what happened pre-game with shapara you know i'm gonna fly out of new york into miami and i'm going to end up meeting up with my tribe mates uh in the hotel in miami and unlike in our transport to the amazon where it's like okay there's gonna be no talking nobody's allowed to talk to anybody you know there it's pretty lax we all know each other We're like hey like oh my god like i can't believe you're here <laughs> like it's so great like again i had no idea this would be my actual tribe and in all actuality i'm like well they're not this won't be the people that i'm in a tribe with because they wouldn't let us have this much time together if this is actually the tribe you know and so the woman who is this reporter like she was like within like earshot and she was like we're here live on the set of survivor all-stars where all of the survivor contestants that you remember are going to be here including Rob Sestronino from like, um, like, oh, no, like that, that was in earshot. And Boston Rob like made a comment also. He was right. like, you know, he had said something to, he's like, you know, I, I guess the reporter must have come over and he was like, hey, you know, there's more people here than just those two. Like, I was like, oh, that's not good. Yeah, like he had said something. So he totally had like a chip on his shoulder, even from the game and you know sort of like bad on me for not seeing it more of like number 19 after winning the immunity challenge the winning tribes thought they would be finally given fire via flint or some matches but commentary team one reveals that jeff says nope however you can make a deal if you want but like what are they supposed to make a deal with oh you know what we got to do you know what we got to do for first place we got Set to light the light the stupid uh scarecrow on fire <laughs> It's the Wizard of Oz. And then and then we were like, Jeff, are we going to get fired? He's like, well, what do you want to give me for it? Like, he's Monty Hall, and we're doing Let's Make a Deal. <laughs> give him Amber. <laughs> you want Amber? <laughs> hey, don't talk bad about Amber. <laughs> Where's Boston We don't Rob? want fire that bad. Number 20. How long do tribal councils go? I imagine it varies from episode to episode and even season to season. But even tribal council one, which seemed pretty simple, for all stars goes well over an hour. Plus, Jeff fought with one of the contestants. What You'll people see. don't see here, too, is this tribal council was like an hour and a yeah, half long. Yeah, they're usually long. It was so long, and Jeff and Jenna got into a huge this, uh, debate. This is where Number 21. Get this. We find out in a secret scene that the players got to write letters and send them to anyone still on the show during the pre-merge. What? Rob Sestrinino wrote one to Colby Donaldson, which is funny, but Alicia wrote hers to the entirety of Saboga, thinking she sounded so smart she was going to reveal players. You be the judge on how smart this is. I really thought hard about what I wanted to do. So I actually wrote my letter with my left hand, so they'd never know it was me because it looked like a little kid wrote it. And I basically wrote it to the Saboga tribe. Beware. Uh, there are three people playing this game that could potentially form an alliance there is one in your tribe, and I just put, be careful. Don't let them come together. And I signed it anonymous. Number 22, pre-incident Richard and Sue Hawk is fun. It's a shame things go the way they do because Rich sends his letter to Sue to screw with her, saying, here's some of the leftovers I caught Nate. I hope you enjoy them. I'll send Sue Hawk some leftover eel or shark bone or something and just ask her if she'd like some leftovers. What is Bones. It? Hey, Suzy Q, after we were all stuffed from about four pounds of eel meat last night, we thought of you. <laughs> Enjoy the leftovers, sweetheart. Who fed you, baby? I fed myself, Richard. I don't need you. She'll be there. Oh, for him. He's such a bastard. He did this and he's a that. And rah, 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 rah. She's just nuts like that, you know? <laughs> 
but I don't care. Number 23, the set they built at the Madison Square Garden for the live finale is spectacular. I feel like these amazing builds the show does just get overlooked or taken for granted a lot of the time, but what went into this just shows how much they cared. The build it, it was about a week and a half and actually put it in here, we put it in a day. Uh, special effects, the flame has been a, a big challenge in the Madison Square Garden. Number 24, how was Boston Rob before proposing on live television? He would have you thinking he was so confident he knew it was gonna go just fine, but he's lying. Amber tells a different tale. I was very nervous when I walked out on stage. Rob was making me the most nervous because he's backstage shaking and his heart is pounding and I'm thinking he's nervous about Lex and, and Big Tom and, and I'm trying to calm him down. He's sort of getting on my nerves a little bit because I think he's overreacting quite a bit and he's making me nervous and I didn't want to be as nervous as I was. It wasn't until about a couple days before that I decided that I wanted to do it live in front of everybody. I just figured that it was a, a fitting end to I mean, where we began our story. Number 25, you would think more people would be salty in their final words of the season, but it is more virtue signaling than anything else for those voted out later. However, Big Tom is livid and he goes on a long tirade that I will keep in the highlights from, but this goes on for almost three minutes straight. Yeah, the way you got old Big Tom off, hey, oh, whoa, 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 good God to pull that knife out of my back. Or is that a Tommy Hawk? It is something sticking in my back. Gosh, I'm mistaken. There's two knives back there. It's Rob and Amber. Both of you got it in my back. Well, Rob, 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 what a dumb little ass you are. The, your best ally sitting right here, put up with your mouth, your boss, and how good a carpenter and all this you was. Shame, shame, shame. But listen, don't worry about me. If you can live with it, I can live with it. Grow up, dudes. And another thing, you've been watching them damn Italian movies way too much. You begin to think you're a boss. Well, right here's your boss, son. If I get a change, I'll put that in your face. Number 26. Did Rob and Amber date before the game, or was them falling in love on the show as legitimate as the show wants us to believe? Well, according to Rob Sesternino during the five days Shapira spent together pregame, Rob and Amber definitely were already getting a little friendly. No, but in all seriousness, uh, so Rob and Amber are getting are getting chummy. I don't think that they were dating before the game. I don't think so. I don't think that they had an alliance. I, I do think that, you know, they were probably, you know, talking in the, in the same way. And I'm not faulting anybody for doing it because I was doing this, the same thing too. But I think that they probably were at least friendly and on good terms coming into the game. There was a little bit of a camaraderie and a little bit of like sort of like the, uh, the old play fighting going on between Rob and Amber at the pre-game Michael Bolton's house. <laughs> Michael Bolton's Ponderosa. My Michael Bolton's Ponderosa. Number 27. Spoilers were rampant for the season at the time of airing. As someone who watched all these seasons live at the time, I recall this era being hard to avoid spoilers. A book was written spoiling all of the Amazon. My mom, the most casual of fans, somehow knew Sandra won Pearl Islands well before the season ended. And All Stars was the worst of them all, but this time it was the show's fault. After the game was over, I went away with Richard and Tina and Rudy, and we were on like this long horse riding trek. And there was like the, we were in like a group of people and we were on like uh, this horse riding thing for several days. And there was this guy who was with us who was very Ertfelda esque, uh, this man. What had happened was when he got back to New York, allegedly, um, he was like, he worked in an office with somebody who is a poster on Survivor Sucks. And that person identified who uh, myself and Rudy and Tina were. And then that became a spoiler that we were, you know, on this horse riding trip. And obviously we had been kicked out of the game. Number 28, earlier I played you a snippet from team two, just trashing Rob for living with his parents. But this behavior is prevalent throughout their four episode commentary. So for the purposes of this video, I'll provide just a few highlights. But uh, imagine this over the course of four episodes, which is like two and a half hours. You know what? It's the typical Ooh, kid that hides behind the doo, playground doo, bully. That's Amber. She, uh, well, that that's true. Her, that's that true. Her, makes her safe, and then she can say whatever she wants. If she didn't have that shield, she wouldn't be doing that. That is she very, very true. She, she, but check out, check, out, check out Rob right now, though. 
Is that not the most uh, sickening thing ever? They make it ever? seem like he's like such a romantic. It's so. Uh, it's okay. ridiculous. You guys, ridiculous. You know what? Do you guys laugh at the, the choice the, of music yeah, whenever it gets it's, dramatic it's in the show? So, yeah. Oh my Whoops. God. Oops. <laughs> Aww, he's falling without his girl on the side. Wow. We know how he falls for chicks. Rob Mariano falls for chicks every ten minutes. It's his big. It's his biggest weakness. I, I have to say. I just don't get it. I mean, I could see why Rob is attracted to Amber, but I don't understand why Amber Amber's is attracted, attracted to Rob. Rob. I, I do not get it. I agree. I do not get it. You know why, it. you guys? Because she just doesn't say much. What? She's there for him. God, his mustache. Number 29. But don't you worry, Boston Rob fans. He's still arrogant. And he calls the jury out on what he thinks of them, too. So for commentary team number three, we have Boston Rob. Amber, Rupert, and Jenna. By far the least interesting of the commentary teams, but anyways, here's Boston Rob's rebuttal. This is what I think about the jury. <laughs> you know, you're talking to two jury members over here. Yeah, but they voted for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I was hoping that the jury would say, you know what, the kid took a shot, he played a harder game, he did what he had to do, he was out there in the open, but instead they went, <laughs> Number 30. In this secret scene that was cut, but really the premiere should have just been longer instead, we see a fake tribal council hosted by Rob Sessionino as Jeff Probst and the rest of Shapira imitating Mogo Mogo members. Lord, please forgive me for my language that I am about to use right now, but Miss Jerry Manthe, I am voting for you. My vote is for Jerry. Number 31. All Star seems like such a slam dunk idea and we have seen the returning format with varying results from epic highs and disappointing lows. Well, Jeff thought season eight would be a disappointing low as he thought the season might kill the show. I've had so many favorite seasons on Survivor. I, I love the All Star season, which was season eight. And the reason I love it is that I was walking with Mark Burnett in Times Square when he we got a call from Les Moonves saying, next season, I want you to do an All Star season. And I remember again thinking, what is this guy Moonves doing? An all-star season? He's going to kill our show. That was season eight. We're on season 25. Clearly, Leslie Moonves knows a thing or two about television. <laughs> but, uh, and he was right. It was fantastic. And we bring back people all the time now. Number 32, Lex is married and no one views him in the wrong way. I have to say this because there is a secret scene where Lex is very much attracted to all the women of his tribe, which contains Amber, Sheehan, Jerry, and Kathy. Are you attracted to them as well? Well, it, for him, it's a thing that happened. There is nothing wrong with the way this whole twist in the tribe thing worked out for old Lex, because I do have my, my little harem of ladies. No one's happier about that than me. It really is funny to see four women and one man, especially when we want to go get fish, and the man's out there with a the harpoon bringing the fish to the ladies basking on the rocks. <laughs> Our fisherman! Uh, Whoa. Yeah. King Neptune! Whoa. Dinner! Number 33. Do you remember when Jenna Maraska quit in episode three so she could go home and see her dying mother in the last few days of her life? Well, what we didn't see is how the Mogo Mogo tribe still went to tribal council that night, but man, this secret scene of their tribal council is such a bummer, I am glad it was not included. Number 34. In Modern Survivor, the show and players act as if they are just now experiencing no food given to them for the first time ever. Completely forgetting how in season 8 this had already happened. They were not given any food and their water source was terrible. But Rob Sestinino says this was a bad choice by the show to do. It's just like they told us if there are parasites in the water, or, or I guess they told us you can't drink the water, you have to boil it. Well, that's what I mean. Uh, and none of you guys have fire for a little while. How thirsty. Oh, that? yeah. I was like, it was terrible because like when I was there, I was like dreaming of like just having like my mouth under like a faucet. And you, I mean, I think it was very unsafe that they had us go that long without having any water. Number 35. When Rupert won that reward, he got to delegate who got what food. Big Tom was so mad for only getting cold potatoes, and Rupert was not oblivious to what Big Tom thought and tried to make it up to him, but uh, it was to no avail. Do you guys know that he tried to do damage control with Tom and he snuck a little beer he into did. Tom's canteen? Oh, he snuck beer into Tom's canteen. It wasn't oh. enough to make up for the cold taters, though. I did. don't think so. Number 36. Despite being the first player voted off a heavily anticipated season, Tina Wesson takes it all in stride and is in such a pleasant mood. If only more players had exited like this, then the season would be a fun watch. But also, she predicts another thing pretty accurately. But I want to leave you guys with a verse. It's very appropriate for this situation. 
Therefore do not lose heart, though outwardly you are wasting away physically, inwardly you are being renewed day by day by the Spirit. Do look at what is not seen, for it is eternal. Do not look what is seen, for it is temporary. I think you might see me again. Number 37, Rudy may no longer be with us, but his legacy lives on through the show and people's stories about him. Rob recalls when him and Rudy spent time together after being voted off early, and Rudy had some criticisms of Rupert that I totally believe. Sure. Like he would say, uh, you know, uh, Rupert, uh, that guy is uh, some actor. He'd be sitting there and, uh, you know, not saying anything. And then they'd come over with the camera and he'd be like, oh, like my wife, I miss my wife. Like, you know, he would, Rudy claimed that Rupert was really big at just like turning it on for the cameras. Number 38, Rob then recalls a bunch of jokes Rudy would make about his Saboga tribe during that time in the pre-merge when they were voted out. That the more I think about, I realize Rudy may not have been joking after all. Uh, Ethan, he said, uh, you know, and uh, Eason, uh, <laughs> he would always, always say it, Eason, you know, Eason, uh, I've been uh, seeing them girls that he's been uh, running around with, and uh, he ain't getting no bargains. Uh, Rudy would talk about, uh, and Jerry with uh, all them pimples on her face. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that big mouth Jenna. It was, yeah, very good. Number 39, but let's hear from Rudy himself. Apparently the show tried telling the castaways that not boiling the water would lead to health issues. And Jerry Manthe came up with the idea that not only did the water have parasites, but actually it had brain parasites. Rudy says, good. Rudy, yeah. did you feel any ill effects from brain parasites? Nah, it probably <laughs> helped me. <laughs> <laughs> Number 40, during the commentary for episode 3, Rob Sesternino and Jenna Maraska go off on an impressions tangent of the crocodile hunter. I have nothing else to say. No, he's like the crocodile hunter. He is like, this croc, he's like, this shark is mine. Crikey, we found a nurse shark it under one of these awesome. rocks. It will be awesome. Oh, he's a feisty little bugger. He's come on, bugger. <laughs> suey, suey. Number 41. In episode three, each tribe had to build a shelter with supplies given to them by the Home Depot. You may remember this as the time Rupert built an underground shelter, which was below sea level. I talked to Ethan's on myself and he said this was his 30th birthday and uh, it was terrible. Anyways, Shapira got fancy and built a swing that the guy judging the challenge was not a big fan of. Good call by him. So you'll see that Rob and Tom put this guy Rafa up on up on the swing, and he did not want to no, sit on the swing. No, he did not. He to... does not look comfortable at all going he... on going on the swing. So they hoist him up. He's not. He does not look thrilled to be sitting. And then on they that. actually swing him. Then he's like, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> so he gets off. Five minutes after he leaves, Big Tom sitting in the swing. The whole thing comes crashing <laughs> down. <laughs> Number 42, in its secret scene, we see the bugs just eating everyone alive throughout the night to the point where they can't get any sleep. It seems terrible. That is except for one person who is thriving. Can't sleep because you're wet and cold and then, then the bugs hit you. It's been a hard time sleeping and a hard time living in this hellhole. Last night was one of the better nights. My body is finally adjusting to this place surprisingly well. My bug bites are going away. I'm sleeping better. I slept most of the night. I didn't get up and tend fire once. Number 43, in a special behind the scenes look at the casting for the show, we learn that Amber basically applied for Survivor the Australian Outback to get out of needing a job for a few months. I was one of those girls who had, you know, a lot of fun in college and I wasn't ready to get a job. So I thought, hey, I'll audition for the Survivor show. That way I can put off getting a job for six months. Little did I know, it's been four years since that first audition, and here I am sitting in this chair, the winner of the All-Star Survivor, and about to marry another Survivor. It's insane. Number 44, have you ever wondered if Boston Rob can fit into a freezer? Well, wonder no more, as he attempts this very feat in his audition tape for the show. Why? For funsies. You come over here and help me out. Hey, how you doing? I'm Rob Mariano. Number 45. Everyone knew Rob and Amber were into each other from the beginning of the season, and Big Tom says, Hey, if you ever have the first Survivor baby, I have the perfect name for him or her. Spoiler warning, this is not what they named any of their kids. You know, Big Tom, we used to always talk about it like, uh, Hey, we're gonna have the first Survivor baby. 
And uh, Big Tom used to say that the baby should be named Crowbar. I don't know why. <laughs> the guy was the first survivor baby is going to be named Crowbar. Number 46. In the show, they wanted to hype up Boston Rob as this amazing player and Rob Sesternino as the incompetent goof, even to the point of having Boston Rob paint Rob Sesternino as a kid building a sandcastle. But the truth of what happens in the scene really says it all. Boston Rob's like, look at this kid. He's like with a pail and shovel. And so ultimately, we, you know, we still don't know what to do. The producers like sort of like point us like in the right direction. Like they sort of say like, okay, I think like I would, if I were you guys, I would look this way. And then like after the producer like tells us which way to go, then Boston Rob like gets out the shovel and then uh, digs the thing up. I was like, oh, oh my God, Boston Rob. But he didn't know where it was. Number 47. I did not realize this happened when watching the show, but apparently the table you're looking at right now was given to the Merge Tribe. That's not the big news of the secret. I just had no idea about it. Anyways, what is the big news is how Rob and Amber would not share it. Wait, remember the table? And they Rob and table. Amber just sleep on, on the table. Slept on the table, monopolized I the table. I hated Hello? the table. The table represented their little power. odd relationship their and power. power. They never let anybody else on the table they sure did. but Jenna. Number 48, Alicia claims that when they all decided to vote off Lex, that a nice, calm, respectful reason was created, and it was Rob's job just to pass that on to Lex. This is clearly not what happened on the show, though, and, uh... What do you think? Lex, I have to say something to you on behalf of all of Shapira. The reason why you were targeted first, and Rob should have made this clear, is oh, because we respected you more than anybody because you were the strongest one out of you three, and we knew that you were a great game player, and you were that's why you were targeted. He well, never that's a lot that easier never to came take out than, of than what I that should have came well, out of his mouth. But we, and always we trusted knew that. him to tell you because he's supposed to be your friend. So we thought he was gonna give it to you straight the way we all decided it, and for the reason we decided. Number 49, Boston Rob is just as arrogant in the commentary as he was on anything else at this point in his life. It's a bit much, but he's also rude to Jenna Lewis is really the point of the secret in the commentary of the finale. Now, you weren't being, this was joking, right? That was like, joking. Yeah. yeah, everyone's like, Amber begged. I was like, I don't think no, that I was, was joking in, around. Yeah. On hey, guys, 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 camp. guys yeah. in the studio, guys in the studio, we're supposed to comment on this, not talk all the way through it, right? <laughs> Jenna, shut up. Hey, it's not no, just, I was asking we're about Sheehan. It was Amber that was talking, by the way, and I was interested. <laughs> Number 50. Why the heck did Amber tell everyone she got a car on that reward challenge Rob took her on? It seemed like a terrible strategic move just watching it on the show, and she is lucky it wasn't used as a reason to turn on her and Rob. However, when hearing her explanation for why she did this, it makes more sense. I was so afraid, though, that Jeff would bring it up at Tribal Council, and you I was totally like, would've. if Jeff would have brought it up, and you guys would have been like, Amber, you didn't tell us that, and yeah. I didn't want you guys to, you know, find out about it another way. Number 51. One. In a secret scene of Boston Rob and Big Tom going fishing, Rob is doing his usual thing of tearing everyone down to make himself look better. It doesn't always work, but here he makes fun of Rupert more than what we already saw on the show. I picked up the box. I went fast as I could to the shore. I beat the little man. <laughs> Shut it up, Rupert. I'm gonna call my fishing pole Rupert from now on. By realizing that we could catch fish, we didn't need Rupert around, which is something that we knew before when we had that. Hawaiian sling because I was able to catch fish but now we got a new Rupert number 52 this next one is short but sweet I will replay the clip over and over so you can't miss it but here you can see the boom pole in the shot and in the shadows on the ground and in this one clip of the secret scene yeah once you see it you can't unsee it number 53 given how much attention he got on the show I am surprised there is a secret scene of Boston Rob having tooth issues because he broke his teeth on a coconut. He claims it stops him from working, but it clearly didn't stop him from going hard in the challenges, so. Two weeks ago, I broke two teeth, the top two teeth on the back right hand side of my mouth on a piece of coconut. And it's been getting progressively worse and worse and worse. It makes you completely lethargic. And I'm stuck sitting around camp falling asleep every two hours, while everybody else in the camp's going, what's wrong with Rob? If you've ever had a toothache or an exposed nerve, you know what it feels like. It's the, the littlest vibration, even from walking, shoots pain like right into your head. Number 54, in a secret scene that expands the yaw reward that Shapira got, everyone has a few beers and they are done. Big Tom, however, can't stop pounding them down. And as it turns out, he is a messy drinker and Alicia hates this. And then we found a bottle pump, a cork right here, the cork. Amber came out. My God, a genie. It was 
beautiful. Her body was like an hourglass. Talking nonsense, telling stories about Kathy being a mermaid and, and coming out of the ocean, and it was a little out of control. Big Tom, he enjoyed himself. Playing a little touchy-feely and flirty-flirty, and everybody took it great, except for Alicia. There is a point where Big Tom goes from funny to not so funny. You know, it's cute for about five minutes, but by the end of the night, we, we all pretty much had our fill of drunk big time. Number 55. In episode four, we saw Rob Sestrinino make an alliance with Boston Rob that when I made his story video, I noticed from his facial hair length that this had to be pulled from a previous episode, like episode two. And it was really out of place. It seemed kind of obvious if you just looked and saw it. In Rob's podcast, he confirms this is true. You know, the conversation that you end up seeing in the episode that I have with Boston Rob had already happened. And I'm not sure exactly at what point but I would estimate that it was probably around the time of somewhere between like day five and 10. I, I couldn't tell you exactly the day that it happened on, but it was well before we lost this challenge. Number 56, the reward challenge that is essentially go fish, but way more fun due to the personalities on the show. Rob Sestrinino had it all figured out and he explains how exactly he hacked this challenge. I knew from the, from the Amazon that the trick to this game is, is that box the, next the, to the you. box to your left I could have helped has my all group. of the exact identical stuff. So As I said, your box does. So I said, now even though Boston Rob doesn't listen to me and asks Ethan the first time out, Everybody else on my try, and that's why we end up yeah, winning. I could have helped them. Is that I tell these guys, ask the person on your left for the same wow. thing. Because for the most part, the most of the boxes are the same as the ones next to it. Number 57. We all could pretty much gather from what we saw on the show that outside of the game, Lex and Boston Rob made some sort of deal that was then abused on the actual island. Just in case you couldn't guess this, it is confirmed in the commentaries by both parties with Lex saying Rob crossed the line and Rob saying, nah, it's just a game. Why is he threatening you right game. there? No, because he won't admit the truth that he did come to Lex and it was outside the game. Right. And now Can that I we, say something wait, to you guys wait, though? Wait, wait, wait because we felt and it was true. Oh, look at that. Oh, Kathy, that all made me he had to do, cry. all he had to do was so admit hard, the truth. So. We're outnumbered here. This but part made Mariano me cry. Mariano and I would talk every week prior to the game. After Marquesa, I gave him advice about his loves. Yeah. I gave him advice about his career. And then he treated us like we were scum. Uh, I mean, we talked on the phone all the time. We were close friends. Wow. And I have no problem getting voted out of the game. There can only be one and, winner. And the game, There's right. no doubt about the that. The game but of Survivor it was how he is did it. about relationships. Yeah. Number 58. If you recall, when Lex was voted out, Kathy offered him the immunity necklace she had won before Tribal Council. Then at Tribal, she doesn't give it to him. And we see him give this shocked expression. I believe this is his true reaction after countlessly watching this tribal council over and over again, paying attention to whether he really did it or not. And Lex says he may have actually done that, but he had told Kathy not to give it to him beforehand. Yeah. Everybody out there yeah. who wondered about this, Kathy about had every immunity. intention of giving me the immunity necklace and I had every intention of not taking it. In fact, in tribal council, I whispered to you, right. if you give it to me, I'm going to turn it down. To set the record straight on that, I'll tell you, they said that it's time coded and that that was at that time, but I... I honestly don't remember ever I reacting that way because I did not want immunity. Number 59. Earlier in this video, we discovered how everyone was given twice as much money for playing this time, with the exception of the winner, of course. And I mused that this means that this is probably why people played conservatively. Well, in the commentaries, it is confirmed that this was pretty much the case. People are really content to be at the bottom. I didn't, I never understood that. A lot of, Big yeah. Tom said to me, I know I might Jenna be fourth was. or fifth, but I'm fine with that. And so is Jenna. Jenna. Oh, oh see, Jenna's I didn't, were, uh, you never heard me say any no, of that. No, you didn't say that. No. But those two were like, I might be third or fourth. I don't mind. Jenna which I always thought was ridiculous. It, it was weird. Number 60, Kathy does not like Jenna Lewis. Heck, even in the commentaries for Borneo and this season, pretty much everyone agrees she doesn't shut up. But on the way to Tribal Council, where Kathy was clearly going to be voted out, she couldn't believe what Jenna asked her. And you know, on the way to Tribal Council, Jenna asked me actually if on the outside I can teach her about real estate. No, oh my God! No, she did I went, Are you serious? You should have punched her right in the face. I, I tried to, I tried to trip her. That's great. <laughs> Number sixty-one at the final immunity challenge. No one talked for the first hour standing there. That seems like it'd be pretty boring to be present for. However, the challenge caused some physical damage that I had no idea about as well. Remember the first, like, the first, like, hour of this thing, nobody said a word. Yeah. It was driving yeah. me nuts because I said, I'm not going to be the first one to talk. <laughs> and right there in the beginning, my arm started twitching. I was like, 
All right, what's going on with that? <laughs> my finger was numb, no joke, for two weeks after really? this challenge. My finger was numb from holding no, on you do to remember. Number 62. I've listened to The Secret a few times to try and understand what exactly they mean because they don't get into too much detail, but it sounds like the show had Rob and Amber hike up a hill or something before Final Travel to get some epic shots, and they cut it out of the show. Why were these shots cut? I have no idea. They didn't even show down one picture from that stupid walk we had to do up that mountain. Oh my god, you're right! I forgot all about that. A that mud crawl. Hike. Through the mud and the rain. <gasps> about that. Number 63. Ethan Zahn, how he has not yet had a secret all about him is uh, beyond me, but apparently his outfit for this season was custom created for all stars by him. The, the history behind that shirt, back in the day when I was asked to be back on Survivor All Stars, you know, the way the process works, you, you send in a couple like clothing items, clothing options, and they help choose which direction they want you to go in. And they said, listen, we're going to have you wear yellow. I'm like, oh man, yellow? Like, I can't wear yellow on TV. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a vein, yeah. as you can imagine. Yeah. So I said, well, if I can wear my Grassroots Soccer logo on it, then yes, let's do it. And they said yes. And then therefore, Grassroots Soccer Yellow was invented right there wow. on day one of Survivor All Stars 2004. Number 64. This next one is something you'll have to read on the screen, but it 100% fits Boston Rob's personality that we know. Apparently, one day he woke up and decided to do the Boston Marathon, but along the way, he stopped and got some burgers and beer. Number 65. In an interview before All Surge began, Boston Rob says he isn't making any pre game alliances with anyone but himself. Yeah, right. Look, I already have an alliance and the game hasn't even started yet, all right? An alliance is with one and one person only, me. I'm not making any alliances with anybody. Oh yeah, you're gonna see me. Oh yeah, nice deal, good job. Let me tell you something, I'm true to me and myself only. I'm here to win. Number 66, after Marquesas and before All-Stars, Kathy hired someone to teach her how to lie because apparently she has no idea how to do it. Believe it or not, this seems to be the truth. But the question I have is, did it pay off? Did we see her successfully lie to anyone this season? You know, when I was called to come back and I said yes very quickly, I said, man, I'm going to learn how to lie and cheat. So I talked to a friend of mine who's a corporate psychiatrist. She's helped me out. I understand people much better now. She's helped me determine who's a liar, how to read into people lying, how to read huge dominant personalities, snakes alike. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to back and I, uh, I'm just gonna ratchet up my, my style of play. So which secret was your favorite? Comment below and let me know. Thanks for watching and doubly thanks for liking and subscribing. See you all next time.